Hi all. I'm. I, is this working? Okay. I'm gonna get close to it. There we go. <laughs> no problem. I'm John Sanderson. I uh, work for the Nature Conservancy in Colorado, and uh, we've um, we, along with many many partners, have been working on the Dolores uh, River restoration project. And associated with that is also um, work to try to change flow management on the Dolores river out of McPhee Reservoir and um, this particular study I'm going to talk about here is an analysis we did of uh, changes in cottonwood abundance along the Dolores um, over the past 75 years. Um, I am by the way giving this presentation for Jan Koenig who did um, almost all of the work here so uh, I can't really claim much credit at all. So uh, here's the study site. Um, of course, McPhee Reservoir down here, the Dolores River uh, runs into McPhee and then north past the San Miguel here, Telluride up here, and then uh, across the Colorado-Utah state line to the confluence with the Colorado River at Cisco, just a bit above Moab. Um, it's about 180 miles of river along that length. And we did this work very much with this restoration partnership in mind. And um, so there's a broad coalition of agencies and individuals who have been working on restoring riparian areas along the Dolores River, along this 180 miles. And um, to, to get this partnership launched, the Tamaris Coalition uh, led an effort to develop a restoration action plan. And I've clipped these aren't the, the complete purpose and vision, but I've clipped a couple of relevant pieces here. Um, one purpose of this plan is to really articulate in a science-driven way what it is that we're trying to achieve, where we want to work, what we want to do in these places. And then the vision, the long-term vision for the Dolores is to have an area where riparian areas are uh, predominantly dominated by native vegetation, but also functioning in a more or less natural manner. So, um, you know, a couple spots on the Dolores, you know, you're all familiar with these, these views, a big patch of tamarisk here, some of which has been attacked by the beetle. And um, over here, um, something that we generally consider more desirable, a multi-H uh, class stand of cottonwood. So, um, there's the on the ground work of actually doing the riparian restoration, which in this case means um, uh, removal of tamarisk and, uh, and also either um, active or passive restoration of the site. So active getting in there and actually planting native plants behind the tamarisk or just removing the tamarisk and, and passively allowing native vegetation to reestablish. But the, the, um, Riparian work is um, cannot be divorced from the fact that this um, piece of concrete sits across the river. This is McPhee Dam and Reservoir. This dam began filling in 1984. It impounds about 380,000 acre feet. Uh, it has a large dead pool, so actually only has about 230,000 acre feet of active storage. It reduces annual flows from between about 30 and 70 percent, and that reduction is water that's taken out of the basin, moved over into the San Juan Basin in the in the Cortez area, in the Four Corners area, and used uh, for irrigation over there. The uh, storage in McPhee reduces peak flows by about 3,000 cubic feet per second on average. This is a chart that uh, Dave Graff from Colorado Parks and Wildlife put together. And what you see here is annual peak at Dolores, this is just above the reservoir, versus annual peak at Bedrock, which is below the reservoir. So prior to the dam, these blue dots show the relationship between the peak below and the peak above. And generally, uh, you'd expect some kind of relationship. There are a few tribs, that, small tribs that come in between these places, but generally as annual peak increases in Dolores, annual peak increases at Bedrock. Um, but this difference between these lines is approximately the amount on average that that peak flow is reduced. We can look at this, these reduction in peak flows in other ways as well. Um, uh, if you look at the pre-dam uh, flow record, you see that 
at Bedrock, which is below uh, McPhee Reservoir, but above the confluence with the San Miguel, the instantaneous peak was decreased almost 48%. I left off a CFS here, of course, but it's the instantaneous peak at Bedrock on average was about 5,000 CFS, and that dropped to about 2,600 CFS. Pre-McPhee, the maximum uh, instantaneous peak measured at Bedrock was 92, almost 9,300 cubic feet per second. Um, these days, the maximum that can be released from that dam is 5,000 cubic feet per second. So similarly, um, about a 50% reduction. Now at Cisco, Cisco is right at the confluence with the Colorado. There's only been about a 14% decrease in that instantaneous peak and a much bigger um, pre-McPhee max. The difference between these two is primarily the San Miguel River, which does not have any major storage on it. So the San Miguel River is largely naturally flowing. So the way you get from 48% decrease to 14% decrease is by um, putting the San Miguel, the relatively natural San Miguel flowing into the Dolores. So we know there are ecological consequences to this kind of um, uh, change in peak flow. Eric just talked about some of that. This is another example. This, uh, these two photos from a, or from a presentation that Cynthia Dot sent me. I uh, hope she doesn't mind me borrowing them. I didn't ask her. Um, if you're out there, Cynthia, thank you. Um, but this is what it looks like. This is shortly after the dam. So the dam began filling in 1984. Um, as Eric pointed out, you know, lots of bare ground here, um, particularly on this point bar on the inside of the bend. Uh, 20 years later, that point bar is heavily filled in with vegetation. So, our, so we know this happens, but um, there's never been a comprehensive view of the river. And so we, we decided to do a real comprehensive view of the entire river. Uh, from McPhee down to the confluence, and we wanted to know what are the patterns of cottonwood as you move down the river? What other kinds of um, uh, changes do you, we see in the river um, as you move downstream? And also critically, what are the changes that we see pre and post dam? Um, so, and then, and then of the patterns we observe in both distribution along the river and change over time, we want to try to explain what's going on there and then ultimately use those observations and those explanations to inform what we're trying to do with the riparian restoration. So we, along this entire 180 miles, uh, well actually we, so we excluded very narrow uh, canyon reaches of the river because there's not a lot of cottonwood in those places, anything less than about um, 90 meters um, from valley edge to valley edge was excluded from this analysis. But for the, for the remaining 100 plus miles, we put a grid across the entire valley bottom, and we quantified cottonwood, bare surfaces, channel, agricultural lands, and then a class that we just called other. Now we did this quantification um, comparing photos from um, the late 1930s and 1940 to 2009. <clears throat> we looked at relationships among physical descriptors of the river and these values we were coming with, and then we were coming up with, and then for select locations, we did a comparison between 37 and 19, right around 1980, just before the dam, and then again 2009. So. Even without looking at the quantification, um, this is very familiar to most of you, I think. Uh, you, just, you can look at these old photos and the new photos and see really dramatic changes. Uh, this is 1937 to 2009 at Big Gypsum. So here's the river channel in a 1937 photo. And here's that, there's that river channel in the 2009 photo. And we've got a couple points marked here where you can see the uh, the same location in the photo. I'm sorry, these aren't, that's not the same location, but this location is the same as this location. And this is, this is where you see the most dramatic change. Over here was the outside of the channel in 1937. Note, of course, that this channel is much narrower than this channel. And again, this bare ground you see very clearly in this photo, and you see almost no bare ground in the 2009 photo. Same thing uh, near Gateway. Um, we are now below the San Miguel, 
but similar kind of response, notwithstanding the relatively natural flow of the San Miguel. Um, old channel here has been completely filled in by vegetation, including cottonwood, so including native species, but there's undoubtedly a fair bit of tamarisk in there as well, which you can't pull out super easily from this photo. But so the channel's filled in, uh, these bare surfaces on the point bar and, and this mid-channel bar are from pretty much completely gone. And again, the channel is much narrower than it was back in 1937. There are some places where we don't see this kind of dramatic change. This is downstream of McPhee, above the San Miguel. This is relatively close to the dam. But in this particular case, um, we do see bare surfaces that have gone away, but the channel width is still comparable. The um, and the veg cover is still comparable between these two photos. So channel here, channel is is relatively stationary, um, and um, not a terribly large difference in cottonwood. So what do the actual numbers look like then? So if you if you take all these grid points and um, they each represent about a tenth of an acre, and you add all of that up, these are the values we come up with for cottonwood channel area and bare surface area pre-dam 1937 and post-dam 2009 or historic and current. About a 70% increase increase in cottonwood where primarily where those channels have filled in. About a 40% decrease in the channel and about a 70%, almost 70% decrease in bare surfaces. Now <clears throat> the BLM did a um, a study of the river back in 1990, and in that study they estimated at a few locations a decrease in channel width ranging from about a 4% decrease to about a 32% decrease. And um, you can see with, when we look at the actual data that <clears throat> that decrease in channel width on average e exceeds this maximum value down here. So um, if you look at uh, how these data are distributed as you move down from the dam. You, of course, see some patterns that jump out at you. Um, one, this, so this is, um, this is the river here. These um, red polygons indicate where we actually did the quantification, leaving out the, the canyon reaches. This is Bradfield, Big Gypsum, the San Miguel coming in right here, and then Gateway, where the resort is, and then the confluence. Um, we, of course, see if you look at channel width as a function of distance from McPhee, the channel width increases as you move down the river. But you see that the current indicated in red here is considerably less than the historic indicated in blue. And then also, very notably, um, these data are pretty noisy here, and these are not. So um, not only reduction in that channel, but a real stabilization of those channels, longitudinally speaking. So if you look at uh, bare surfaces as well, similar kind of dynamic. So this is bare surface in acres, distance from McPhee. In this case, there was not, there's not an upstream to downstream trend in bare surfaces, but similar pattern where um, the data are noisy in the historic photo and bare surfaces um, can be up to 50 acres in some of the study sites we looked at. And then post-dam, or current in the red, um, uh, dramatic reduction in bare surfaces and a lot less noise in those data. And then how does that uh, show up in the cottonwood? Again, we've got cottonwood acreage over here. Uh, red is current and blue is historic. So here you see mostly the red is greater than the blue, but not entirely. In this big gypsum area, there's actually been a relatively stable cover or even reduction of cottonwood, and that's been documented in a couple of other reports in the big gypsum area as well. Um, right below the dam, a pretty dramatic increase in cottonwood. And then again, once you move below the San Miguel, indicated by this line, um, a fair bit of noise in both the pre and post um, dam data. So we did 37, we did 2009, uh, we documented these changes. Can't really say it's due to the dam from that comparison from 37 to 2009. So in a few locations, 
um, we are looking very closely at not only those historic 37 photos, but also uh, photos from right around or right before the dam. And then um, in 2009, again, so uh, trying to isolate the um, uh, what has happened around the installation, uh, installation of that dam. So similar kind of pattern, uh, qualitatively speaking, um, this is below the San Miguel, but again, you see bare surfaces in 37, bare surfaces in a fairly wide channel in just before the dam in the mid 70s. And then in 2009, the bare surfaces are largely gone. The channel is much narrower. Um, comparable flow levels here um, in, in a way, but I mean, we do see that 2009, that flow is much greater. So what you see here is actually not directly uh, comparable to this. If you put 296 through here, you would probably see an even smaller channel. So what happens when we quantify the 37 to mid 70s to 2009, or in this case, this, these particular sites we looked at uh, were derived from 82 photos. We say from we see from 37 to 82, actually a slight decrease in cottonwood. The channel from 37 to 82, almost no change. Bare surface from 37 to 82, almost no change. The dam goes, starts filling in 84. 30 years later, you see a big increase in cottonwood, a big reduction in channel, and a big reduction in the channels, uh, in the uh, bare surfaces. So we did look at a number of other um, <clears throat> ways of interpreting these patterns we're seeing and relating them to the physical variables. Um, these are, again, distance from McPhee with change in channel, change in bare surfaces here, and cottonwood. But these, change, these aren't absolute values now. These are, these are changes uh, going on uh, from, from the 37 to 2009 era. So if you're at zero, in this case for channel width, there's actually little change below the dam. And for some points out here, there's little change as well. So you see this pattern as you move downstream. You move from the dam down through Big Gypsum to just above this, the San Miguel, and the channel is constricting increasingly as you get down to the San Miguel. But then past the San Miguel, that channel uh, constriction is considerably less and there's a few sites where there's been very little channel constriction. So the, I can give you the overall values, but you can't necessarily say that those overall values of change um, represent what's happening at each individual site. And we want to understand what's happening at each individual site because that may affect what kind of restoration activities we put on the ground. So similar thing here where these are bare surfaces and there are a handful of sites below the San Miguel where there's been little change in bare surface, but some sites where there's been a lot of change. The pattern with, this is cottonwood, so an increase, I described this before, the increase in cottonwood just below the dam, um, little change in the big gypsum area, and then below the San Miguel, there's actually a variety of responses in there. So, um, this is this particular site. This is just over the Utah State Line, um, State Line Rapid. Some of you, probably many of you, know. Um, this is an example of a site that actually hasn't changed much, and you can actually still see. Then, if you look at, at in this photo, if you look closely, you see a lot of bare ground here, a lot of bare ground here, um, bare ground up here, uh, and if you were to compare the historic photo with with this one, um, which I just pulled. Uh, off of Google Earth earlier today. Um, this is, so this is the most re recent photo we have from this place. This still looks like an active river. And if you were to compare the channel to the 37 photos, you'd see that there's little change in width, relatively little change in cottonwood here, and relatively little change in bare surfaces. We think one thing that's going on here is that this drainage here, coming in from the side, and then a drainage over here as well, these are having a big influence on what's going on on the river itself. So you see, this is so far just hypothesis that, that we're working on, but we, we know that there's sediment coming off here. You can see the debris fan. And then this sediment is causing disturbance and sediment deposition down here, that, and not to mention that there's additional water coming out of that drainage. So that's 
causing disturbance and sediment dynamics that complement what's going on in the river itself. So what do we do with this? Well, we want to do a, few, a, a bit more research around these things, but I think um, you know, so there's some obvious both research and monitoring things that we want to do. We, we want to um, follow up on that, that tributary notion that these tribs are actually helping to complement what's in the river as far as riparian dynamics are concerned. And um, if, if, um, if that is indeed the case, then it may well be that in the vicinity of those tributaries, we can actually expect to have some of those natural functions sustained, notwithstanding the presence of that dam. And it'd be good to be able to distinguish between what, where those natural functions can be sustained and where not. But we also need to do the kind of work that Eric was just describing, where we, we monitor change in channel form. And so is there more constriction going on if we're removing tamarisk? Is that um, making the, uh, the, the stream banks more erodible? And so we'll get uh, uh, an increase in, the, in uh, erosion and the active channel area. And then especially one thing we see real clearly from these, uh, from these data is that with these large floods constricted as much as they have been, um, it's not at all clear along much of the river if the 5,000 CFS flood we can get out of McPhee can even do anything because we've in, in a lot of places because the channel has been constricted, the banks have been armored by both Tamarisk and Willow and our native Willow. And it may well be that you can put down the river the largest flood you can get out of McPhee and you're still not going to recreate any of those bare surfaces. You're still not going to uh, maintain channel width. So how does that, that, that then um, show up in our restoration efforts? Well, if we can identify those places, we use these data to identify those places where, where there is some level of natural function continuing, then we can not worry as much about those places and let them uh, let them take care of themselves. And so we certainly see more natural function below the San Miguel, but then especially near these tribs below the San Miguel, it appears that um, uh, that there is some uh, fair degree of that natural function continuing there. Um, we probably want to, when, to the extent that we do active restoration, we probably want to do it in places that are currently static under the, the uh, water management regime. And, and then when we talk about riparian restoration, we need to keep in mind that it's, of course, inextricably linked with the flow management out of that reservoir. But then also, it may well be appropriate in some of these places to use management actions, bulldozers or whatnot, to actually do channel restoration where you, uh, you remove that, those hardened banks and try to recreate the connections between the water and the channel and the riparian areas and to recreate some of those bare surfaces as well. These are all uh, just notions still, um, and I'm, I'd be very happy to hear uh, any feedback or questions that you all have about this work. Um, there are many, many people who have been working on the Dolores, so I you know, really need to thank all the researchers whose work I've drawn upon here, the Dolores River Restoration Partnership, um, the work that the Tamaris Coalition did initially to get us started was invaluable. The Dolores River Dialogue, where we're um, talking about water management, uh, has been a really important component of all of this work. And of course, the Walton Family Foundation for funding this and much uh, additional work on the Dolores. Thanks. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes right there in, in the center there. In some of your earlier photos, you showed quite a bit of change in the Dolores River immediately below, uh, post dam change immediately below the town of Gateway. And yet, that would seem to be an area that's significantly influenced by a fairly large tributary in Westwater Creek coming in at that very same location. So how does that reconcile with the notion that you're exploring farther down where these tributary areas might be locations of uh, normal function? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Dave, and good to see you, and congratulations on your new job. Um, uh, I don't have a great answer to that yet, but uh, definitely made that same observation. One thing that clearly shows up in the gateway area, of course, is the is the land management. Lots of, of historic ag in that area. Um, there's the town itself, and there's management of the river. Um, it might also have something to do with the nature of that tributary. Divide Creek coming off, or the, the creek coming off the divide there, um, uh, it, it's steeper than some of the ones you see lower down. It may have a smaller sediment supply. We don't know, but um, um, we're going to be following up on that question and try to understand it a little better. In, in the back. Good morning, Jen. Um, would you want to venture any opinions as to what sort of water protection approaches might be most meaningful in light of your results, like wild and scenic suitability and stream flows? What, what makes the most difference? Um, in, in this, I mean, what makes the most difference is a, if, if you're after natural function of the river and sustaining the native species and the native ecosystems, then you really need to address um, the flow regime in a in a comprehensive manner. Um, of course, fish need water every day. A friend of mine is fond of saying so. You, those fish, those uh, base flows are really vital. But if without the uh, the peak flows, then you end up losing and simplifying that fish habitat. But you also see the kinds of consequences that we see in the riparian as well. And so you, we have to address both sides of that. Of course, the tools by which we address um, uh, both the base flows and the peak flows can differ. Um, in this particular instance, I mean, one thing where you saw in, in the Flaming Gorge slides that they've actually done a fair bit of remanagement of Flaming Gorge to, to try to get bigger peak flows. Um, and that probably needs to be done. I mean, we're certainly having that conversation around McPhee, whether or not we've identified the highest peak flow we need to get uh, with releases from that dam, I don't know yet. I think we need to understand that better. Okay, thank you very much.